Once again, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Tonight's program is part of our Coastal Mountains Land Trust Winter Lecture Series. Tonight, we are very happy to welcome Nicholas Fisichelli. He is the CEO and president of the Skudik Institute at Acadia National Park, and he has collaborated quite a bit with the Coastal Mountains Land Trust. So he has been asked here tonight to give a program called The Future Force of Coastal Maine. So without further ado, I would like to turn the program over to Nicholas. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Great, thank you, Julia. And I'm just getting my presentation up here. All right, hopefully you can see that first slide. Yes, it looks perfect. All right, excellent. Well, great, well, welcome everybody. Thanks, Julia, for, for having me. And thanks to everybody at Coastal Mountain Land Trust as well, to Polly and, and Jack and Jackie and, and others there. Uh, and for having, for inviting me tonight. So I'm gonna be talking about the future forest of coastal Maine. And just to start off, just to introduce myself, again, I'm Nick Fisichelli with Skudik Institute at Acadia National Park. So we're a nonprofit partner of the National Park Service, uh, inspiring science, learning, and engagement for a changing world. And, and so we try to really be forward looking in our work um, and a, a key piece to this really is for Tibet and tonight's talk is thinking about the fo future forest. How are the forests going to look in the future? Which trees are going to thrive? Which will struggle? How do we even approach figuring out answers to those questions? Um, and, and so that's where some of the research that we're doing in, in collaboration with Coastal Mountain Land Trust comes in. Uh, it's easy to think of forests uh, as you know, places on the landscape that, that don't really change a whole lot. But we know that, that really they, they actually do. Uh, and we know that Maine's trees have responded to climate change. In the past, it's a good for us to think about you know, um, change in the future. It's useful to look back in the past and think about how conditions have changed. And, and as Julia mentioned, please feel free to, to uh, put a question in the chat box as we go along. If I say something that, that sparks a question or a comment, uh, please please uh, chime in and, and add a comment and Julia will be uh, monitoring that. So we can look at Maine. Here's a photo of Maine from 18,000 years ago. <laughs> this is how Maine probably looked 18,000 years ago. Um, and and in, in some sense, we do have photos of how Maine looked in the past. And, and, and this is the camera here. This is Sargent Mountain Pond in uh, Acadia National Park. Um, and the camera is the, really the sediments at the bottom of uh, the pond. So every year, pollen that gets dispersed by plants, including trees, some of that falls on the lake and then uh, uh, sinks to the bottom of the lake. And every year there's a new little layer of pollen that gets deposited. And in lakes and bogs, in, in uh, environments where there's not a lot of uh, oxygen, that pollen is preserved for, can be preserved for tens of thousands of years. And so, although we don't have an actual camera to take photos of the past, we have amazing evidence of uh, forests in in the past and from places like Sargent Mountain Pond, which is the likely the first lake in Maine, meaning that the first lake that was exposed as the ice retreated. And and from all of these pollen cores, so pollen scientists, they take cores of the sediment from the bottom of these these ponds, and then they look at the different pollen in the different layers and. The, the deeper you go in the layers, the older the, the pollen is. And from that, from lakes and bogs and wetlands across the US, uh, pollen scientists have been able to, uh, <clears throat> to reconstruct what forests look like in the past. And so this is for spruce. Uh, this is showing the abundance of spruce on, on the landscape beginning 21,000 years ago. You can see the big blue ice sheet here, the continental ice sheet. And then the green areas are where there is uh, evidence of, of spruce via pollen. And the dark, excuse me, the darker the green, 
the, the more abundant spruce was in the pollen. And we can make this run uh, and I'll show every thousand years. And you can see the ice retreating north and the trees following that ice back north. Uh, and you can see actually, especially about three, 4,000 years ago, uh, spruce was actually even further north than it is today. And then over just the last uh, couple thousand years, it's really come back down in Maine. And there's evidence that there were refugia along the coast. But the, the point here, and we can just run that one more time, uh, is that the forests on these time scales are really dynamic and, and uh, trees are moving across the landscape and changing over time and really chasing their climate uh, across the continent up north and then even back south a little bit as there was a little bit of cooling over the last couple thousand years. And then we can even look more recent in time and see that there are lots of changes that continue to happen on these more recent uh, timescales of, of the past century or so. And so some great work by uh, Caitlin McDonough McKenzie and Glenn Middlehauser and others uh, looking at what plants are found in Acadia National Park today and what was found there back uh, 140 years ago, 130 years ago or so. Some of the initial work back in the late 1800s and and this work was focused on on Mount Desert Island and over the you know to, to ask how much change was there in 135 years there's of course a big national park here lots of land is protected we would think these are systems where where species are are persisting in these protected landscapes and you know, surprisingly a large number of species have disappeared from Mount Desert Island over the last about 125 years. Um, and about 16% of the species found in the late 1800s plant species uh, were not found again. And many declined in abundance as well. Um, there were many new species. So the total number of species actually increased um, from 730 to 830 species. Uh, and this was due to new arrivals and, and especially some non-native plants that increased on, on the landscape. So these historical records also help capture that change is happening. Uh, and change is happening today as well. This is an uh, image of a uh, forest here in, in Acadia National Park. Um, and if you can see in the red circled areas, you can see some reddish brown trees there. Um, and these are red pines that have died from a red pine scale, so an insect that has arrived just in the last decade here and really decimated the red pine populations in, in Acadia and, and really across the Northeast red pine, there's a, a, a complex of diseases uh, that are, are attacking it right now. So we're seeing some changes happening uh, today and for trees. Uh, and for other species as, as well. Many of you may be uh, birders, bird enthusiasts. Certainly birds are often bellwethers of change. And here I'm just gonna show you a figure of uh, two species. We'll start with boreal chickadee and then the northern cardinal. And this is from the Christmas bird count. Many of you might, might uh, uh, participate in the Audubon Christmas bird count. This is from the Scudic point circle. So over on the Scudic Peninsula, that circle has uh, over 50 years of, of data of uh, uh, Christmas bird counts. And this is showing year on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis. And then the abundance of birds, it's birds per party hour. Birders like to party. Really, it's, it's observer hours, so it's corrected or standardized for the number of observers. Uh, and what we see over time here, the dots, each dot is the abundance of boreal chickadees in, in a year. Uh, and you can see over the last 50 years, there's been a, a sharp decline in boreal chickadees uh, in, in the, the Scudic area. And then sort of conversely, Northern Cardinal, we see a, a different pattern here. And here we see over time that Northern Cardinal has really been increasing 
in, in abundance. And it's a species that's been shifting its range north. And, and we see this here locally in our data. And so I think with, with all of this, really the, the key theme here is that nature is dynamic. It's super dynamic, whether you're looking at it over thousands of years or the last hundred years, the last 50 years, or, or even the last decade. There are lots of changes uh, that have been happening. And, and I'm, I'm focused here on, on Acadia and changes in Acadia, but certainly there's no reason to expect that these kinds of changes aren't happening um, in, in your neck of the woods across coastal Maine. Uh, this is certainly, I think these trends exist and if there are historical data, they often support that there are big changes happening. Nick, um, Marcy has asked a great question. She says, where did non-native plants come from and were they a detriment to the native plants? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So these non-native species, typically they're of European or, or Asian species um, and they, they either got here uh, accidentally, that they, they sort of hitched a ride in, in shipping materials, um, or often they were brought in and planted. Um, and so people wanted to bring from, you know, settlers from Europe wanted to bring some things with them, including some of the plants that they were very fond of. Um, and so often these, these species were planted here and have since, since escaped. Um, so garlic mustard, um, glossy buckthorn is a really uh, tough invasive here, uh, bittersweet, um, uh, Japanese barberry is, is another. And so there's species that often were, were brought in uh, and planted and, and then they, they escaped from cultivation. And there are many species we plant in our garden that don't escape, they, they don't, they, they may not do really well, but others do basically <laughs> too well and, and they, they escape out of our, our gardens and have become naturalized, so, so to speak. Yeah, great question. So thinking ahead for the uh, forests here of, of coastal Maine, and, and again, we'll start just with, with Acadia uh, as the, the example here. Right now, Acadia's forests are overall are doing pretty well. I mentioned that that red pine uh, ha has really been decimated by uh, the red pine scale. It's a, a an uncommon species in in the park. Just grows in a few areas. The park is mostly red spruce. So this just shows the ten most abundant species in the park uh, measured over two different time periods. This is some of the forest health data that Kate Miller of the National Park Service uh, leads. And you can see there's lots of, of red spruce in the park. It is the primary species. Uh, and, and what's you know, interesting for, for this area, um, and we're in this transition zone between uh, the temperate forest to the south and that true boreal forest to the north. Um, and, and projections are for really big changes in potential suitable habitat. So this is some work uh, that, that uh, I did with uh, US Forest Service collaborators looking at potential change in suitable habitat for trees by 2100. And, and if you see uh, the last column on the right, the red arrows pointing down mean a strong decrease in suitable habitat. The X's are for basically extirpation. And only one of the 10 most common trees, Northern Red Oak, uh, shows a, a minor change, really no change in potential suitable habitat by the year 2100. And under a, 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 you know, a major change uh, climate scenario, so a high emissions. Uh, scenario. So this is a computer model which basically looks at where trees are found on the landscape today, what the conditions are like where those trees are found, and then where those conditions will be in the future. Uh, and so a lot of potential for change based on the computer models here. And so change, change may happen. Like I said in the past, or said of the past, you know, there was a lot of change that happened. So one of the big questions, you know, what, what do we do about that change? Should, should we be hands off? And, and 
you know, the answer is maybe to that. Um, here's just sort of a, a an example uh, from Morristown, which is a National Park Service site in New Jersey. I'll show three pictures here over nine years. Here in 2009, you see the understory actually lots of bittersweet here. Uh, excuse me, uh, barberry here in Japanese barberry in the understory. There's some area that's open here as as well. And what we see over time is that these non-native invasives are, are really uh, crowding the understory. And by 2017, you see this really thick, formidable, formidable shrub layer of Japanese barberry plus some others, um, uh, garlic and mustard, I believe, in, in this photo as well. And so you know, there, there's potential without intervention for this kind of uh, 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 dynamic to happen where some of these invasive species really come in and and take over in some of these these forests and this is to the south down in in New Jersey uh, but this is something that's happening especially across the the mid Atlantic region so this is then where where science comes in to help to understand and and manage for potential transitions that are going to to happen and really this is a part of of climate change adaptation adaptation being about adjusting to changing conditions and there's a, a spectrum of management responses from resisting change to just accepting change to directing change um, and you know, the the right response is going to vary um, and, and it'll depend on on circumstances, on the resource, on the location, the time frame, etc. And the idea of resisting change, keeping things as they were now, as they are now, or, or were in the past, accepting or accommodating change is about just a, allowing the changes to happen sort of a, autonomously. And then directing change is is really taking a more active management role towards some specific desired new condition. And again, options will vary over time across space and, and, and among conservation uh, targets. In, in the work that we do, and in, in, uh, including the, the work uh, at the, uh, with Coastal Mountain Land Trust that I'll mention in a minute, it's really doing some of the science and that, that <laughs> dirty hands, I like to say, the on the ground research, getting our hands dirty with some of the science. And, and then the computer models, such as what, what I showed those results from and the shifts in potential suitable habitat, their models, they're a great tool. They're, they're one tool in the science. And, and we want to go sort of beyond that, use that information, but do real on the ground tests to see how are trees going to do uh, in, in the future. And doing so, for example, across local climate gradients. So planting the same suites of tree species at warm sites and cool sites and seeing how, how they fare. And so one example actually within Acadia National Park, uh, a study we call it the tree test bed study at four different sites, growing 19 different tree species and using Acadia's climate variety or variability. So we have sites, the warmest site in Acadia and then a very cool site uh, and a couple in between, and we're following uh, these trees over time, looking at their growth and survival. And, and for a subset of the tree species, we actually grew them from seed. Um, and we found you know, really big differences among species uh, and especially sites in their abilities to grow and establish from seed. And we did this over the last few years, which had really warm and dry uh, summers and, and drought conditions. And you can see here, the coastal wet site, you can see here where, where Libby is, is working. It looks like a lush little rainforest here, um, sort of a, a <laughs> reminds me of Costa Rica. Uh, whereas to the right here, it's the, the same numbers of seeds were planted in this warm dry site. And you can see lots of bare soil here. Uh, it looks more like, like a desert. And, and so just small changes in temperature and moisture availability between a coastal wet site and a, and a warm dry site within Acadia really resulted in big differences uh, among tree species and sites in their ability to establish and grow. So really showing high sensitivity uh, to moisture availability, uh, especially for those, those early 
uh, phases of life when they're seeds and little nascent seedlings. Nick, uh, Lucy actually asked, she says, I'm already noticing a loss of white birch in the mid coast. Is that temperature sensitivity or what is causing it? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Yeah, so paper birch or, or white birch, um, it is a northern species. It's one of the true boreal species. So it's found from here all the way across Canada, Arctic, you know, uh, subarctic Canada into Alaska. So it's a true boreal cold adapted species. Uh, and we're pretty close to its southern range limit. It does grow a little bit further south, um, but it's, it's fairly sensitive to warm temperatures and, and dry conditions. Um, it also likes lots of disturbance. Uh, it's, it's what we call an early successional species. So it likes big disturbances. If there's a, a big windstorm or fires, which we don't have as many of, but in say the lakes region, it really regenerates well after fire. So we're seeing two things with it. One, we're not seeing the same big disturbances um, necessarily that we've seen in the past that helped white uh, birch establish, but it's also getting warmer as well, and it's projected to do poorly. So it's a combination of lack of big disturbances that it needs for regenerating and the warming and, and drying conditions. We also had another question coming in about this slide. It says, was that a horse chestnut in the warm dry site? If so, would you extirpate it? Ah, uh, uh, so it, it is not a, a horse chestnut. In, in here, uh, in, in this project, although, uh, so a horse chestnut, it's actually a European uh, uh, species, although there are closely related ones here in the, in the US, which are the Buckeyes, um, although there isn't one that grows here in, in Maine. Uh, but we chose for this essentially, half the species are found today in Acadia, and the other half are ones further to the south. Uh, that uh, are projected to have suitable habitat in the future as conditions continue to warm. And we found interestingly that we expected a cr that the warm dry site, you know, that the, the warm adapted more southern species would do better at that site. Uh, but really there was actually moisture was the biggest driver for this seed experiment. Um, and that was really driving which species do well. And so we, we often think of climate change about warming temperatures, but there's also shifts in the precipitation regime and moisture availability that are also going to be really important uh, in, in the future and are actually much harder to model and project how moisture uh, is going to change in the future. Great questions. So I want to mention the work we're doing uh, here more, more locally. Camden even makes it onto the map here uh, that you can just barely see. Um, this is our uh, future forest of coastal Maine experiment. So this is a sort of an outgrowth of that, that work at, at Acadia where we're growing eight tree species at four sites. So the uh, Coastal Mountain Land Trust site in, um, there's my cursor. In, in Belfast, the, the Head of Tides site, um, we have a site in, on the Blue Hill Peninsula, actually Blue Hill Heritage Trust, Surrey Forest site. And we have a private property in, on Mount Desert Island and, and, and a site uh, with Maine Coast Heritage Trust on the, the Scudic Peninsula. And, and there's actually a little bit of a, of a climate gradient here, going from, from warm in uh, the west to cooler in the east as you go further down east and you get beyond uh, uh, Penobscot Bay. Uh, and, and so here we're, we're planting uh, eight tree species. And then I should mention Waldo County Soil and Water Conservation District, uh, Alita McKeg uh, has been really instrumental as well in this project, especially at the, the uh, CMLT site in, in Belfast. And, and so we have in, in this experiment, uh, eight tree species. So three Northern species, species found here on the landscape today, Eastern white pine and, and red oak, which are really more, more temperate tree species, and then white spruce, which is another true boreal tree species, grows here on the coast of Maine. 
and grows all the way through the boreal forest up to uh, up to Canada in actually into uh, Alaska. And then again, these these five southern species, white oak. White oak is found here in uh, in Hancock County, um, and, but not found uh, at these sites or found also in Waldo County. Uh, it's right at its northern limit. Chestnut oak found in and and red cedar both found in southern Maine, but don't make it quite this far yet. And then uh, tulip tree is found in southern New England, but not found here. And finally, sweet gum, which is found even a little further south. But these are all tree species that are projected to have suitable habitat here in 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 the future. And so. Our work is to, to sort of test out to see, are these species going to do well? Which ones are going to fare well and, and which ones will struggle? And to provide that information for making then some management decisions. And so at the Head of Tide site, we had a fun uh, planting day out there with some great volunteers uh, that came out that work with Coastal Mountain Land Trust, came out and, and planted with us. You can see all the tree seedlings. So these are nursery grown uh, tree seedlings. We, we put them here in buckets of, of water just before they go into the ground. We should get a corporate sponsorship from Home Depot that we haven't done that um, using their, their buckets here. And, and then planting these in, uh, in different plots um, at, at four foot spacing. Um, between each tree and in, in basically a grid so that we can then track each individual seedling over time. So here's an individual Eastern white pine that was planted. It gets its little flag there uh, as, as well to market. And, um, and this is what a, a plot looks like. And you can see the, uh, a lot of the seedlings you can, you can't see without their leaves on yet and they're very small, but you do see the blue tubes here. Those are to protect a subset of the seedlings from uh, browse pressure. So typically it's, it's white-tailed deer, although at the Scudic site, uh, snowshoe hare is very abundant as well. And so these, these tubes, they help to protect the trees um, from from browse, so we can get a sense for uh, uh, if there's a climate signal versus a, a browsing signal on these species. Deer and and snowshoe hare, moose, other browsers, they can be really important in affecting the trajectory of a forest and how long it takes for the regeneration layer, so seedlings and saplings, to grow up above the browse line and and eventually to ascend into the canopy. And and these species are selective herbivores. Basically, they know what they like to eat. And, and the forest floor is sort of an all-you-can-eat buffet. And they know there are some things that they like at the buffet and some things that they don't eat. And so there are big differences among uh, the tree species. For example, red, eastern red cedar is, is not preferred, whereas the oaks are, are delicious. Similar, similarly, white spruce is not uh, browsed typically by white-tailed deer but the snowshoe hare quite like it. And so each species varies in its, its palatability and, and how much it gets browsed. And so we added these uh, uh, tubes to help protect the subset to be able to tease out the browse response from uh, climate response. And so we're going back to these, these sites annually a couple times a year to follow um, growth and survival. Here, here's Alita uh, looking uh, at a tulip tree seedling that you can see there that she has her hand around. Uh, and we're looking to see if it's alive and then look, getting its growth, so its total height and, and following growth over time. And, and we were able to do this, this work this year uh, as well, uh, doing so safely during the, the pandemic, working outside, working with masks for the, the two visits that we had uh, to, to these sites. And, and we just started this um, uh, a couple of, of years ago. Uh, so we're just in, in year two of, of the study, uh, but looking after year one, uh, here are the eight species. Uh, 
and this is just survival uh, of these species. So the Belfast site, the head of tides, CMLT site are the blue bars, the, the Surrey forest on the Blue Hill Peninsula, the orange bars, the gray bars are the Mount Desert Island site, and then finally this uh, yellow bars are the uh, Scudic site. And, and you know, overall, the uh, Belfast site had the highest survival rate. The, the Belfast site is the warmest site. It's also the richest site as far as the soils go as, as well. So it has really good growing conditions for species. Um, <clears throat> the Scudic site generally had the lowest survival. It also had the highest level of browse uh, on, on a lot of the species. Uh, there's pretty heavy snowshoe hair browse at the, the Scudic site. And, and some differences among species. Uh, interestingly, interestingly, red oak, which is a local you know, native species, uh, had, had one of the lower uh, survival rates. Whereas the, the two most southern species here, tulip tree, sweet gum, they actually did better than some of the native species as far as initial survival goes uh, after just, just one winter. Um, in, in the data. And so this is something we'll be following over time uh, to help be able to, to you know, see the forest through the trees and understand how trees are responding to changing conditions and to use that information um, to inform stewardship of, of our forests. Nick, is there anywhere where you are posting this data for anyone who might be interested in wanting to follow the project? Yeah, um, we, we don't have a site right now um, for data. We, we've just, really, this is the, the first data we've had a, a, after the, the first year. Um, but we do have a, a, a page for this on the Scudic Institute website. Um, and, and we definitely, as we build more, results we will we can definitely share those and and post those on on our sites um, with trees of course trees are, are long-lived um, many of these experiments we do the one i shared in acadia it was just a three-year experiment and and actually we 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 sampled and 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 uh destructively sampled all the stems at the end of the three years in those test beds that we had uh, so that we could actually look at, at their roots and get a sense for biomass below ground of these different species and compare them. And so that was just looking at a few years, uh, the first three years of life essentially for these trees. Uh, the hope with the, the study here, this Future Forest of Coastal Maine study, because it's, it's uh, at different sites, uh, the trees are spaced further apart that we'll be able to run this project longer uh, over time to get some more meaningful results to see as these seedlings, small seedlings are all, you know, they were about a foot tall uh, to start with, one to two feet tall. You know, are they able to survive beyond the first few years? And, and so using these, these sites will hopefully be able to track this long term. We have a number of other questions that, that has, have come in. Are, are you ready for me to, to, to shoot them yeah, at you? Yeah, let's do it. All right, okay. So again, if you have any questions that you'd like to type in, go ahead and type them into the chat box now. I'm gonna scroll back to some that came in earlier in the program. Uh, Kaysen asks, and again, this was when you were showing those, those initial slides at the beginning of the changing uh, forests um, over the mass spans of time. Uh, Kaysen asks, what would the old growth forests have looked like if it all hadn't been logged out? E e e that's, yes. So, so that, that's a good question uh, on, on that. And we can look at, you know, that there's, there's some small places on the landscape today that have old growth forest. Um, Actually, Drew Barton at uh, UMaine Farmington, he, he just wrote a book recently on, on the subject. I don't remember the title of it off the top of my head. Um, Andrew Barton is, is his name. Uh, but there's a few places on, on the landscape. There's the, the Big Reed Preserve, which is a, a nature conservancy site near Katahdin. Um, there's a few places, certainly in, in Acadia, some of the steep steeper slopes that didn't get logged that we can see what the forests 
uh, looked like. Certainly there would have been more older trees, uh, more larger trees, um, but it also depends too we, on, on the disturbances and the disturbance regimes that happened. And so we often like to think that it was a, a contiguous forest everywhere, but there were always disturbances happening, whether they were uh, big wind storms or ice storms, uh, you know, certainly hurricanes uh, always came through historically. And so forests would have looked a lot messier is one of the things than they often do today. Um, we sort of have in our minds what a forest looks like, but it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot tidier because we're typically taking wood out of the forest, whether it's for firewood or harvesting for, for timber, uh, for lumber. Uh, and, and so these forests in, in the past would have had a lot more, what we call coarse woody debris. So a lot more logs on the forest floor, a lot more standing dead trees as well. So a lot more structure and, and heterogeneity to the forest in the past. The species composition would have been very similar to what it is today. Um, spruce was dominant. You know, if, if you think about 500 years ago, uh, spruce was definitely dominant in, in Maine and, and, and red spruce specifically, uh, with white pine more uh, in, in southern Maine and, and in the river valleys. Um, and so the species were similar. Some have increased with, with uh, you know, European American settlement. Uh, there's more red maple than there was in, in the past. Um, but otherwise, the species composition is pretty similar. Um, Matthew asked a question that I, I think you've probably answered, but um, I can expand upon it a little. He says, do you have any statistics, charts, maps to show some of these changes to the forest? It would be curious to see. This was asked earlier in the program. Um, and again, I think you, you've answered a lot of it, but on, the, um, on your website, are there places where folks can look at resources that would um, help them better understand the changes in the past that have happened? Yeah, I, I think I'm trying to think what the, the best resources are for, for that. Um, yeah, some of the studies uh, that have been done, the, uh, there's a big forest vulnerability assessment that was led by uh, the Forest Service. Uh, the, and, the, and I can try to find a, a link to that and share that, but that has some more information about the, the projections of forest change and, and for individual species. And it's a great resource to share. It's a forest vulnerability for New England and Northern New York okay. uh, is, is that report. All right. And certainly um, on our website, the forest ecology page has info on some of our, our projects uh, as well. But some of this more historical information are, are the vulnerability assessments um, that that Forest Service report is, would be a good uh, starting place. Thank you. Um, Dave actually says, uh, when we think of forests, we tend to think of all that we see above ground, but the real magic is in the soil with the web, and I'm going to say this wrong, uh, mycorrhizal fungi that connect trees and other organisms to an intricate web of life. Are you folks doing any research on what's going on below the forest floor? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great comment and question, right? So mycorrhizal fungi, these are the, the fungi that have relationships with plants and, and especially with, with trees, but other plants as well. Uh, kind of like a, we know with lichens that they're a fungus and an algae that have a symbiotic relationship. Many plant species form these symbiotic relationships with fungi and this all happens below ground. And, and, and you're right, we, we know very little about what happens below ground compared to what's happening above ground, but it's th those relationships are really critical for both the tree species and, and the fungi as, as well. Often the, the fungi provide the, the nutrients from the soil and, and, wa and help with uh, water uptake as well, and then the plants are providing the sugars through uh, photosynthesis. And like any marriage, it's a give and take. Sometimes the trees take more than the fungi and vice versa, and it's really complex relationships. Um, we do not, we are not looking at that right now in this study, but it's definitely an area for further research. And 
the the mycorrhizal fungi, the, these species, typically they can be uh, uh, form relationships with many different trees, and so likely there are uh, uh, varieties and species on the landscape that won't be a uh, limiting factor for trees trying to expand their ranges. Thank you. Um, Matthew, who had asked the question prior that I, I, I may have butchered, um, <laughs> he's asking if I can unmute him to, um, to ask a question. So I'm going to go ahead and hit unmute. I can't actually see Matthew, so. I'm right here. All right. Okay. Go ahead and ask your question. Um, that's, it's really been informative. I'm a graduate student at Rhode Island School of Design. I'm also a data scientist, and I'm working on a project kind of in this area, so it's been amazing knowledge um i guess what i'm wondering is um one second there's a lot of threats to like northeastern uh, northeast uh woods and forests uh logging deforestation non-native species over browsing by deer diseases excessive sound levels those are all several of them i guess what i'm what in your in your working to learn about how trees survive to make more informative decisions. I guess what I'm wondering is um, what, what is needed in terms of engagement from other people or what do you need to, to help in the future to, to better combat um, the threat of climate change and forests? Is it more money? Is it more people helping? Um, what, are, what are some of the topics that are, what are some of the most like vital things to be doing right now? Yeah. Great. Th thank you for, for that question, Matthew, and, and sounds like you're doing some great, great research, uh, great work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> more, more money, more money is always good. Um, but, but there's lots of things, uh, certainly more, more research. Um, you know, paying attention, I think, is, is just, you know, it is itself really key that, that we pay attention to nature um, and that we work with nature and, and I think do a better job of that than we we have in the past um you know we are stewards of of this planet um and you know i like to say that the biggest uncertainty in future climate is human behavior and and that's you know we we don't know if it's going to warm another two or six degrees you know in the coming decades and the reason we don't know is because we don't know which uh, greenhouse gas emissions pathway we're going to be on. And, and so, you know, human actions are, are what's really critical. And, you know, the horrible pandemic we're going through right now, we're seeing how, you know, collective action on, on the pandemic, on creating a vaccine, you know, on, on developing these, these uh, health and safety measures like wearing masks, doing these things, you know, that, that we can really uh, uh, have positive effects on change um, and, and use science in ways to benefit society. And so I think there's, we, we need to be doing that here as well. Um, so, so more, more research and, and people, every, you know, if you have a woodlot, you have, you have a small forest, you know, what's happening in your forest, pay attention to what's out there. What tree seedlings do you see on the forest edge? in the uh, gaps in your canopies, uh, in, in the forest canopy, but those are gonna be the, the future trees. And so which ones are doing well, which ones seem, seem to be struggling? Uh, there are some citizen science platforms as well, you know, like eBird and iNaturalist are ways where you can catalog some of your observations. Uh, there's also the, the National Phenology Network, and, and some others uh, more local as, as well. Um, some of the land trusts uh, often have what are called phenology trails. So some of the ones we've worked with, they have phenology trails set up where people, citizen scientists can go out and monitor when different species are leafing out and fruiting and when those fruits are available for birds, for example. So there are different opportunities uh, for, for folks. And, and, you know, with climate change response, there's, there's two pieces. There's adaptation and there's mitigation. And the adaptation is about adjusting to the changes that are already happening and that are baked into the system for the next, you know, for the coming decades. And we need mitigation for really slowing down the rate of climate change so that 
the adaptation we're doing today is still going to be effective in in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thank you so very much. much. That, that was amazing. Thank um, you. Thank you, Matt, for your question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have a number of other questions. Uh, Catherine asks, is the brown tail moth likely to keep proliferating? Is it relative to the temperature changes that you were talking about? Yeah, so the brown tail moth, I'm feeling itchy just, just talking about <laughs> it. Um, I'm sure many of you are as, as well. I, I observed the first one on, on my property this past summer. I, I live on the Blue Hill Peninsula. Uh, we've only been there a few years, but but it's really been expanding. It's, you know, it's it's interesting in that it's been around for a long time. It's an, it's an invasive species. Um, it, it had been at high levels and the population really dropped for reasons that I, I don't know. And I'm not sure if, if those are known or not. I'm not, not an expert on, on the subject, but it's really been expanding again across the, the landscape. Um, it is more in coastal areas and so there's a thinking that it's it is uh temperature sensitive in in winter time so those really cold bitter interior main uh temperatures it, it doesn't it can't survive those but it's doing unfortunately really well on the coast right now um and joan asks could you discuss balsam fir and its relative health slash future survival in coastal woods yeah balsam fir of course it's a a, a species that that is very very common here uh, in in Maine. Um, if you have a wreath uh, on your door right now, it, it's balsam fir. Uh, it was made here locally. It's it's a species just like spruce that's projected to do poorly uh, with warming temperatures. It, it is another boreal species, um, and so it it's we're we're fairly close to its southern range limit. Uh, and so it is projected to struggle um, in in the future. It's doing pretty well still at this point, but especially with the more drought conditions, um, projections are are for it to struggle. There's also the balsam woolly adelgid, which is an invasive insect pest, um, which is having some effect on on it as well, especially in coastal areas where it doesn't get as cold in winter. George asks, is your evaluation of survival by species going to result in a decision to manage the forest? So, so one of the things I, I'm wearing, I'm wearing a hat here, I'm wearing my scientist hat. Um, in, in doing the, the research, uh, we, we are not the land managers, um, but we're working with land managers to help inform those, those decisions. Um, so, so I can't speak for CMLT or other partners in uh, in this future force of coastal Maine study. Uh, I will say on the some of the research specifically in Acadia, we are using that information. For example, uh, we're working on a restoration project on the summit of Cadillac Mountain. So working with the park and with uh, Native Plant Trust, which is formerly the New England Wildflower Society, and through some of the experiments that, that we've done and, and, and colleagues have done, it's helped inform which species to utilize up there. And, and really with the question of, are the species that, that are found up there now, are they going to do well in, in the future? And, and, uh, and actually, Caitlin McDonough McKenzie, who I mentioned, she did a reciprocal transplant experiment for some of those species at different elevations on Cadillac. And, Turns out actually from, from her, her data that there's a lot of mixing of the genetics of the species at different elevations. And so there was no difference in, in performance of a low elevation population of blueberry or um, 3 2 syncofoil compared to the ones at the summit, suggesting that the species should be able to do well as conditions continue to change. So one, one example of, of using uh, results from these types of experiments. Another question asks, does Maine conduct controlled burns in forests? Uh, that's, that's a good question. It, it's fire is something uh, here in the Northeast. It, it, you know, first off, forests are made out of wood. We know wood burns un, under the right conditions, um, but the right conditions are, are pretty rare here in the Northeast compared to for example, the Great Lakes states, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, where fires are, are more common. 
Um, so there is some prescribed burning that happens. I, I can't say how, how much. I know the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, they do a, a fair bit of prescribed burning, but that's more for uh, waterfowl habitat. And so that's in meadows and marshes that they use fire as, as a tool. Um, it's used less in forest settings. And Theo asks, where do hemlocks fit in the spectrum of change? And we had another um, audience member who also mentioned that they're noticing a lot, a lot fewer hemlocks. Yeah, hemlock. So, so hemlock is a wonderful evergreen tree species. Uh, it's pretty close to its, its northern limit here. It's really a, a temperate species. Uh, you know, it's one of the species it should do okay into the future. Um, under climate change, but it's dealing with a horrible pest right now, a couple of them, the main one being hemlock woolly adelgid, which is, is causing mortality of the species. Um, I worked back uh, in the early 2000s at Shenandoah National Park down in the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia, and there was a, a, a hemlock woolly adelgid had been established there for, for quite a while, and then in the early 2000s, there was a, a two-year drought, and that just combination of drought and, and adelgid uh, resulted in about 98% of the hemlocks dying in uh, Shenandoah National Park. Um, and, and, you know, really, really tragic um, what, what happened there. That, that was 20 years ago. Um, there are more management techniques out there for HWA, as it's called, hemlock woolly adelgid, including some biological controls, some, some uh, lady beetles that uh, have been released in places like uh, the Smoky Mountains down in, in Tennessee, North Carolina. They've, been more effect they, they've had more success in protecting hemlocks. And we've seen in New England a lot lower mortality rates from hemlock woolly adelgid because it's colder here. Uh, and, and so the hemlocks have been surviving better even with hemlock woolly adelgid. So it's a species that you know, is having some other stressors besides climate and that's you know, important for many of these trees. Eastern white pine is, is another example that there's a, a, a whole bunch of these uh, needle diseases, a complex of needle diseases that it's dealing with right now and and part of that is due to wetter springtime conditions and so these these fungal pathogens are you know, they grow better when it's wet in the spring and they're causing white pine to drop its needles early and and it's it's a species projected at least with climate to have lots of suitable habitat in the future but um, from the the model projections but right now we're seeing actually that it's struggling Interestingly, those wet springs that you just mentioned, uh, last year we had an entomologist speak at the library who said that those, a, a number of wet springs in a row will help with the brown tail moth population. It will help to, you know, help it to decline. So uh, <laughs> fingers crossed for at least a few wet springs. <laughs> um, Alita has posted some, um, some resources. She also says, I highly recommend Andrew Barton's book, The Changing Nature of the Maine Woods to see to statistics and readable summaries of the changes in the Maine forests over time. Um, and she has posted a link to a two-page summary of predictions, modeling of tree species changes in coastal Maine. So thank you, Alita, for that. Um, David asks, years ago, I heard that woods-related industry started to plan for climate changes in their replanting. Can you comment on any of that? I, I don't know much, much about that. Um, one of the things we're, we're really blessed with here, especially in Maine, is lots of natural tree regeneration. And so that there, ha there often isn't a lot of planting that needs to happen. It's really a sort of an, a service, an ecosystem service that the forests provide that, that make it less expensive to manage forests and, and to grow the, the future forest. The challenge there is that some of the species establishing may be losing habitat in, in the future, and so <clears throat> planting may, may need to happen. Um, I, but I, I can't say what's happening on industrial forest lands here in Maine. You know, th these are, are really 
smart, sophisticated folks that, that uh, are doing the, the silviculture and the forest management. And they're definitely looking into these issues as well. And I'm sure that they are, are uh, also testing adjustments. Uh, we only have a couple more minutes, so I'm just going to jump to one or two more questions. Uh, Lucy asks, we are having increasing wind events that topple spruce trees. If we replant those areas with an eye towards diversifying the forest, are there certain, quote, aspirational trees, tree species we should consider? And that's, a, that's a very good, good question. I, you know, one thing with forests, you, know, you have to ask what, what your goals are for, for your forest. Are, are you managing, you know, we, we ask a lot of our forests. We, we ask a tremendous amount. We expect, you know, clean water, clean air. Uh, we expect timber, so, you know, fiber. We expect uh, wildlife habitat, game habitat, recreation, other things. So one thing, key thing is to think about what, what your goals are for, for your forest. Um, and and plant different species. Um, if if they're wind prone, you know, bigger older trees are ones that typically are more wind prone, uh, whereas younger ones uh, will will fare better in in wind events. Um, but uh, uh, you know, look at what's doing well in the understory uh, in the woods around around your you where you live uh, can be a good indication of which species you may want to favor. Um, and we'll have this as our last question. Um, this is from Juliet. It says, do you and your team think climate change will enable Japanese knotweed to spread even more? And do you worry about its impact? Yeah, Japanese knotweed. It, I'm not sure there's anything that can stop Japanese knotweed. It's such a, a <laughs> unbelievable uh, invasive species. It just takes you know, a tiny bit of its root in soil that gets moved around and, and it takes off. Uh, I, I don't think so. I think it's you know, it, it's a species. At the same time, it's it's shade intolerant, so it doesn't invade into forests. It likes disturbed open areas, so like highway medians and areas like that that are have have uh, high sunlight are where it does really well. And I don't know of anything that can stop it. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, we have a number of other questions coming in, but unfortunately we do have to wrap up. Um, Nick's email is right up on the screen there. So um, it's fine for folks to email you questions, Nick. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay, super. Uh, Ian, who's from Coastal Mountains Land Trust, I noticed is on the call. I've made him a co-host. I wanted to give him a chance to say something if he wants to. I'll give him a moment. Ian, did you have anything you wanted to say? I'll wait to see if he jumps in. Um, again, I mentioned at the top of the program, this is part of a series that we do that the Camden Public Library does every winter with the Coastal Mountains Land Trust. And I highly encourage you folks to visit the Coastal Mountain Land Trust uh, website and also to visit librarycamden.org to get all the latest information on the upcoming programs that we have. We'll be doing these on second Thursdays throughout the winter. Um, Nick? Thank you so much. This was fantastic and extremely informative. I really appreciated you coming and speak with us tonight. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And, and uh, thank you for having me. Thanks to Coastal Mountain Land Trust. All right. Keep up the good work. We appreciate it. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>